All right, everyone, welcome to the webinar. We're going to be getting started in just a minute. We're going to give everyone just a, a minute or two to get uh, connected, and then we'll, we'll start with a bit of a technical introduction just to let people know what they should be seeing and how they can interact with the presenters, etc. So we'll be with you in just a minute. It looks like most of the lines are getting connected, so uh, so let's just let's get started. Um, my name is Doug Maynard. I'm the associate director at CAFC, and I'm filling in for Lisa Stormquist, who's uh, away on vacation right now. I think she's on vacation, anyways. Yes. She's not in the office, anyways. Um, <laughs> uh, she and Lisa is our pa uh, coordinator of uh, patient safety uh, and quality uh, projects at CAFC, uh, and I'm uh, pleased to be part of our monthly. Uh, patient safety collaborative meetings. I'm just going to give a bit of a technical introduction uh, before I hand it over to our uh, co-chairs uh, Tracy Wrong and Darlene Bolliver to introduce our speakers. Uh, basically you should see uh, uh, the presenter's desktop. That's my desktop at, the, at this moment and I have our CAPC's Knowledge Exchange Network currently up on the uh, on the screen. Um, these recordings are uh, or these presentations are recorded and they are posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network. There's a handy search box so you can find uh, any of the patient safety presentations or presentations from many, many of these other uh, programs that we have at CAFC. Uh, today's presentation is our family seeing something we're not uh, with our presenters Jeremy Daniels, Mark Ansermino, and Anne-Marie Taylor. Uh, and the, pres the, the video, audio and video of this presentation will be posted on the site here. And during Jeremy's portion of the presentation, he uh, is going to be referencing a number of reference articles. Uh, so please do uh, go and check out those articles here. They're all linked to uh, to these uh, three uh, links right here, uh, and the URL for the Ken for the Knowledge Exchange Network is ken.cafc.org is how you get there. In order to answer uh, ask questions, we don't uh, actually. I'm not sure. Do we typically unmute speakers for to ask questions, or do we we only we only allow people to type in their questions? Usually, it's a uh, it's difficult with considering the number of people we have attending the session. So we require you to type uh, your questions in. You should see a question box at the bottom of the control panel. It usually opens up on the right side of your screen. Uh, feel free to type in your questions as they arise uh, in, so you don't forget them. And, and when there's a break in the presentations, if the, if the presenters ask if there's any, been any questions or at the end of the presentation, we, uh, we, can, we can address any of those questions that have been uh, queued up in the uh, question box. We're also going to be having a number of uh, poll questions throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll have about five of them, and you'll have we'll have some instructions. We'll let you know when those appear, but it'll be an op your opportunity to see the poll question come up and click on the screen to select your answer. There can only be one answer per line, so if you're watching with the group, you're going to have to have some kind of a process to come to quickly come to consensus and have one person select your answer. So uh, that's all I have. So I'm going to hand uh, the presentation over to uh, Tracy Wrong. Thanks, Doug. Um, welcome, everybody, to the May edition of the Patient Safety Collaborative Call. Um, uh, with my co-chair, Darlene Bolivar from the IWK. She is online, but I'll be leading most of the session today. And I am the Director of Quality over at the Children's Hospital in Ottawa. So uh, we're really thrilled today to, um, to have our special guests, uh, Dr. Jeremy Daniels, Dr. Mark Ansermino, and uh, Anne-Marie Taylor. Uh, with us here today, and what really caught our eye was a recent article uh, published in January in the CMAJ uh, referencing specifically identification by families of pediatric adverse events and near misses is overlooked by healthcare providers, um, which is sort of something that uh, for anybody that's ever participated in the collaborative before, you, that would catch your eye. And uh, therefore, the title of today's session is Our Family Seeing Something That We're Not. Um, so we're just thrilled to have our speakers here today, and we hope to engage any of you on the collaborative um, in, a, in a healthy and interesting discussion. For those that might be new to the collaborative, uh, we do these talks uh, on a monthly basis and hope that they would be very interactive. So as Doug mentioned, uh, enter your questions in online, and uh, we certainly would try to hope, uh, have uh, an interesting dialogue. Um, this, Bear with me as I'd like to introduce the, the great backgrounds on our speakers. Uh, Jeremy Daniels is a resident in anatomical pathology at McMaster University. He received his uh, BASc in mechanical engineering from U of Waterloo in 05 and an MD from UBC in 2011. 
Uh, Jeremy has worked as a research engineer for the pediatric anesthesia research team at BC Children's Hospital from 05 to 11. Um, uh, Mark Antomino is an associate professor in, um, in the UBC uh, Department of Anesthesiology, Pharmacology and Therapeutics, and is a pediatric anesthesiologist at um, BC's uh, Children's Hospital. He has a master's degree in health informatics from City of uh, from City University in London in the UK, and the specific interests are in technology to support personalized health care. He holds a scholar award from the Michael Smith Research Foundation in BC. And finally, Anne-Marie Taylor is a provincial director of the BC Patient Safety and Learning System. She studied nursing at Mount Royal College, received a BSCN from University of Victoria, has a Master of Arts degree in leadership from Royal Rose University, and completed the CHSRF uh, executive Training for Research Application, or EXTRA, program. Anne-Marie was given a CRNBC Award of Excellence and was recognized by the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council with the 2010 Award for Leadership and Quality Improvement in Patient Safety. So you can tell by those three, the introduction of those three uh, stellar panelists that we're going to have a great chat um, today. So at this point, what I will do is turn the presentation over to Jeremy. Uh, who will actually be uh, running his slides. He's actually in Chicago right now, so it tells you just how uh, pan-North American we are today. And uh, so over to you, Jeremy, and Mark and Anne-Marie, and we'll uh, get on with the discussion. Um, Jeremy, you just stay as presenter, please, and uh, just move the slides forward. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, was it okay. Yeah. Mark was getting it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, well, thank you, very everyone. It's really... Um, fantastic opportunity for us to come and talk a little about our research. Um, you know, this uh, project is something that Jeremy and I have been talking about for since 2006, so that's when we sort of came up with the idea of this project. And this was really motivated by the fact that um, as researchers, we really saw the, the fact that clinicians were not really engaged in reporting safety events. And we had racked our brains in trying to propose a way that we could get clinicians more interested in doing this. And certainly as a clinician myself, I really felt that having reports from patients would be the thing that would really engage me. And that's where this project was really born. And over the years, we've had a long and arduous journey to get to the stage now where we've actually finished the conduct of the study. So there's many people who have been involved in this, so many people from our research team, and, and particularly Anne-Marie Taylor from um, our hospital, or well, provincial patient safety learning system, and um, a number of other clinicians and collaborators that we've had working on this project. And here's just a list of some of them, and by no means all of them. Next slide, please, Jeremy. We've also had support from a number of research partners from the Canadian Institute of Health Research, and uh, uh, CPSI, which is the people who funded the main project on this. Obviously, my time has been funded by the Michael Smith Foundation, but also we've been very well supported by the Children's Hospital and our local research institute. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Jeremy, who I'm sure you'll quickly realize is a real es expert in this field. Over you too, Jeremy. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, so I think uh, probably those of us who are here in the meeting today are, are probably familiar at least a bit with some of the seminal research on patient safety and adverse events. Um, I think probably uh, the Baker Norton study back in 2004 and CMAJ looking at the incidence of adverse events in Canadian hospitals is pretty well known. And I think when, when the article came out, uh, you know, there, there had been previous studies done in Boston and New York State, but it was, I think, for a lot of Canadians, pretty uh, revealing um, when you do a chart review, you know, how many adverse events you actually can identify, and particularly the fraction of them that, that they found with the high rate that they uh, estimated were preventable. Um, you know, the, the basic statistics being, you know, around 7.5% of, of admissions experience an adverse event, and about two-thirds uh, uh, would be preventable. Um, 
deaths per year due to adverse events, and and uh, a whole lot of uh, potentially preventable hospital stays um, and uh, healthcare dollars spent. And then the other thing, uh, sorry, before we go on, was that um, you know that study that the Baker Norton did was such a great study, and it's it's really great when you read it and you compare the results of that study to other studies that were done in Australia, New Zealand, and the states. You see that the results are fairly similar. Um, which ha uh, has a really nice convergent validity to it. Um, the, and then after that, um, I'm not sure of the audience's background, but um, you know there was a big push to actually go ahead and, and develop um, adverse event reporting systems within hospitals, um, which were to a large extent uh, modeled after aviation industry, uh, where adverse events and near misses were reported. Um, so that the engineers involved could look at the system and redesign things to hopefully uh, prevent a recurrence. And so these systems were, were put into place uh, in hospitals around the world. Um, I think probably in the you know kind of early 2000s. Um, nowadays they're quite commonplace. Interestingly, at my hospital, McMaster, we, we still don't have one of these, um, but it's uh, apparently under development right now. Um, so the question is, you know, in healthcare, you know, how do we actually change and, and how do we identify those things that are happening that we can modify and make safer? Um, well, the idea that we had was basically, as Mark said, modeled after, um, again, the aviation industry, where in the aviation industry, Pilots, I, I felt, were highly motivated to go and report the adverse events that happened to them, basically because they were the ones in the plane, and, and if an adverse event, in fact, did occur, then their life was on the line. Whereas I felt that um, healthcare adverse event reporting systems expecting clinicians, that is, nurses, physicians, uh, whoever, to, to report, really kind of missed the point, because there, there wasn't as much incentive for those people to report adverse events as there were for actual uh, patients and family members. And then the second uh, realization that, that I had was that, you know, um, physicians, nurses, OTs, PTs, all the, everyone in the healthcare team is so overworked um, that, in fact, to expect them to go and, and report adverse events on top of their workload is actually a, a very difficult challenge. Whereas families uh, who are admitted to hospital, they're so, a lot of them anyhow, are so involved and so interested and dedicated to the care, that they are very, very happy to go and report adverse events and really do anything they can to make the system better for future patients or for uh, themselves as a patient in the future. So that's really where, where we got the idea from, as a way to, to supplement uh, healthcare reports. Um, you, can, you can all see the picture here. This is a picture of how our uh, adverse event reporting system by families actually work. This is a child here admitted to hospital in, in Vancouver, and this is her parent here uh, submitting an adverse event report uh, on the morning of the child's discharge using a laptop here. It was really that simple, and this is Kate who did a lot of the work um, and gets a lot of the credit for the uh, research studies that uh, we're going to talk about here today. Um, so just to give you guys a bit of a background, um, and as Doug said, uh, the pap these three uh, papers here have been published on the site for you to read. Um, the first one uh, we published, um, I think it was in 2007 or so. It was really a literature review on what was out there on the topic. At that time, there wasn't a whole lot. There was probably, I think, well, we'll go through the slides and identify how many, but um, around a dozen or so. Um, then we published a paper on the... Uh, science of how we developed the uh, web reporting tool. Um, just to give you guys a bit of a background about some of the metrics that you might want to use if you go ahead and design your own tool. Um, and then the, the meat of the presentation is really talking about what happened when we actually gave this tool out to families uh, at Children's Hospital in Vancouver to use. Um, so the literature review, um, we did a pretty extensive uh, review, um, 90 keywords, whoops, sorry, uh, 90 keyword searches related to adverse events and reporting either by patients or their families. Um, yield, that, that didn't give us very much, as you can see. There wasn't a whole lot of, of papers out there at the time. 11 papers, and then we got two off the reference list, list and then the people who reviewed the paper um, suggested an additional four. 
Um, and we analyzed uh, the papers, looked at the different healthcare settings that they were uh, published in, um, looked at variables such as whether um, people were asked to report adverse events specifically or whether it was more general and um, people were asked to recall what had happened in a, in a more general or less leading sense. Uh, analyzed by study duration or, or whether were people actually compensated for the adverse events. Um, we looked at how participation rate was affected by these variables and whether it was affected by um, who was actually asking the family or patient to report the adverse events. For example, was it a hospital member of hospital administration or was it a member of the uh, volunteer committee at the hospital? Um, we looked at reporting methods, so was it electronic or paper-based? And then uh, some great work from Saul Weingart in uh, Boston looking at uh, corroborating the adverse event reports, which is whenever you deal with this stuff, it's, um, it's, a, big, it's a big issue, right? So what percent of, of adverse event reports will you get from families that are actually legitimate versus not so much? Um, so that's the first question we have for, for the audience. Um, I'm curious to know what the audience thinks. Are, are patients, in fact, actually able to reliably report safety events, or do they give um, information that's not necessarily useful to quality and safety people? Who's that one? So we can see that 92% uh, of people have said yes, that patients are able to reliably report uh, safety events. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so if we let's advance the slides here to the next one, it's interesting um, response. So in, in fact, it's quite right, and that and that's what um, the the papers that we found that actually went and investigate that actually did find. I think they found about an eighty percent uh, corroborate, corroborated uh, rate, um, maybe a little less than ninety. Um, and as you'll see, it's, it's probably a little bit less than we found in our study. Um, but again, um, if you go and read the paper, paper, you'll see that to compare from one study to the next, um, even in a subject as well-defined as adverse event reporting by families or, or, or patients, um, there's a lot of variables that can affect things, and that includes um, you know, the basics of how you go and actually get that information from the family, and certainly the terminology. The terminology is a huge issue for when you're talking to families about um, this issue. So we did, as I said, um, the, the article is available for you and if you ever know someone who wants it, it's an editor's choice article which means you don't have to pay for it, it's available for free on the website. Okay. Um, the next thing we do, we did when we, we were going to develop our system was we did a pretty broad based uh, human factors and uh, survey science um, evaluation of it and, and the paper is there for you to see but essentially we looked at a, a few validity markers and usability because the tool is a, a web-based instrument we wanted to make sure that it was usable um, but also from a survey perspective we wanted to make sure that it had appropriate validity so that we could put some faith in the uh, results of the survey when we actually get them. Okay. Um, we, so we did um, use an iterative process for designing the system and, and the results of the experimentation that we did showed that uh, in the end we had very good face uh, validity um, and, and good usability as well uh, from a uh, systems perspective was very good. And we found that uh, the reports that we got in this experiment mapped quite well to the, the actual domain. So without going into the details, um, just to let you know that there was a fair amount of background work in developing uh, the questionnaire um, that was used to ask families these questions. Um, and if anyone, again, is thinking of de developing a system like this at their hospital, I, I would recommend doing a lot of work on this end um, to avoid asking uh, questions that don't give you the information that you really want. Um, let's see, whoops. Um, and then the, the meat of the talk today is really what happened when we went and actually developed, or sorry, gave this system to families at Children's Hospital. So <clears throat> for a year, uh, from November 09 to 2010, uh, the FRS is the family reporting system. We offered this to uh, 545, uh, 44, sorry, families being discharged from the ward, from the ward at BC Children's. Um, the ward's described in some more detail in the paper, but essentially it was a, a general ward at Children's Hospital that included general surgery, general pediatrics, and uh, neurosurgical patients. Um, and basically, uh, I'll show you the the slides of the system. In a, in, a, in a minute, but 
families were, were asked to interact with the system and respond to, to several questions about whether an adverse event uh, had occurred uh, in each of the following domains. So we asked them, did a medication error occur? Uh, did you have problems with equipment in the hospital? Did you have complications of care? Uh, did you observe miscommunication between, between staff? Or were there uh, miscommunication families can report? Just trying to advance the slides here. Okay. Um, the reports that we got from the uh, families were we then classified by degree of harm, uh, likelihood of recurrence, and uh, quality of information in the report. And um, now what we'll do is we'll go through those results. And as uh, I think it was Doug at the beginning of the presentation talked about the, the full report um, of this uh, data is available on CMAJ. And again, it's linked um, at the uh, site uh, that you logged on at. Okay, so here's a uh, screenshot of the uh, system. You can see it's just opened up in uh, uh, Internet Explorer here. And you can see an example of uh, this here is the medication section. So the main point here, so it's cut off, section, it should say section one at the top here, uh, medication problems. And that's when a medication is not given exactly as it was meant to be. Uh, and then we give examples, and, and the face validity uh, work that we did was going through the exact wording of, of these types of statements. Um, so a parent interacting with the system would, would answer the question, do you think a medication problem occurred or was stopped before occurring? Uh, that's the catch the near misses, and they would use this drop down menu to select yes or no. Um, then we had an option here where patients could, uh, or sorry, families could populate the uh, medication problems that occurred from a predefined list. Um, or they could include ones that were stopped before occurring, so patients were able to enter more than one. Um, they were able to provide more detail in this box here. And then we included some other interesting questions, like were staff, in their opinion, were staff aware of this? Um, if you discussed this problem with staff at the hospital, did the discussion meet your needs? Did you receive an apology from staff, which is another interesting question. Um, and if they had any thoughts about what um, staff in the hospital could do to prevent such a recurrence, because that was the other area that we want to get into in the future is using families to actually go ahead and, and try and design solutions or be involved in solution making to adverse events. So the next question, so given that we asked 544 families being discharged from the general pediatrics ward in our province, um, if they had problems in these types of domains, how many do respondents think uh, reported problems? So we'll open up the survey. So the survey is open and uh, we're able to answer now. <clears throat> uh, we did have a question come in. Uh, Dawn was asking, she was referring to the, uh, the, the journal article that you were, you were um, discussing at the, at the first one. Uh, okay. She was asking where that was published. Oh, uh, the uh, human factors in survey science article? I think that was the one you were talking about, yeah. Yeah, I think that was uh, quality and safety in healthcare, as I recall. Uh, I can pull it up here. Actually, I've got it here. The International Journal of Medical Informatics, is that? Uh... Yeah, that's it. Yeah, International Journal of Medical Informatics. Yeah, quality, safety, healthcare was the uh, review paper, actually. Excellent. But as, as, uh, as we've mentioned, they are available on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, the, the actual journal articles are there with all of the, uh, with the full information of where it was published, et cetera. So, uh, so I think we've, uh, everybody's given an answer, so we're a little bit across the board here with these answers, so we'll just flip them around. We've got 35% uh, 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 said 121 people mm -hmm. reported problems. 38% uh, thought that uh, 221 people would have reported problems. 19% thought 321. And 4% thought 421, and another 4% thought 521. <laughs> okay, interesting spread. A nice uh, kurtosis at the end. Um, so the the correct, well, well, what we found in our study was 321. So those were the lucky guessers, um, or about 60%, um, which is a lot higher than the classic adverse event report. Well, you know, if you read Baker Norton's study or, or any of the ones done in in uh, New York or Boston or New Zealand, it's quite a bit higher, right? 
Um, but it's actually uh, consistent with uh, some of Saul Weissman's work. If, if you people don't know, um, or sorry, Joel Weissman at, at Mass General, um, who found uh, the patients in his studies identify twice the, the frequency um, as, as you get to in chart reviews. Um, so the next question is, you know, given that that rate is pretty high, what uh, percent do people think are, are actually, you know, legitimate safety concerns versus uh, dissatisfiers? So that's the next uh, kind of question. We'll open it up for the poll. So we've got, uh, of the uh, 320 reports, 7% uh, of people thought that 7 were judged to have act to be actual harm. 40% uh, thought 77 out of 321. 30% of people thought 177 out of the 321. 17% thought 257 out of the 321. And 7% thought 307 out of the 321 were actual harm, were judged to be actual harm. Okay. So... 177 was the uh, what we found in our study. So I guess about I think it was about 30 percent of people guessed that. Um, so and and if you read the paper, you can go through the method we used. But essentially, it was a, a two reviewer system to to identify the report, and uh, it was basically you know did it seem legitimate? Um, so in our study, the main result would be that. You know, when we when you ask a general survey of families being discharged from our ward, about uh, three out of five uh, actually go ahead and say that there was a problem, and about half of those, or one and a half out of five, or three out of ten, uh, say that their concern is actually, when you look at it, directly safe, safety related. Okay, so again, a, a fairly high rate, um, and cer and certainly higher than what you'd see in the Baker Norton study, which again wasn't a pediatric study. Um, but there you go. And, and just to give you some examples of the uh, reports that we did get, and you can see more of these in the full paper. Number, you know, number one would be a nurse hung a bag of meds uh, that my kid was allergic to, uh, despite a large sign on the door and an allergy warning on her bracelet. Um, number two, uh, suction equipment at the room was assembled incorrectly, um, led to an accumulation of fluid inside the patient. Um, got Stevens Johnson syndrome, hospitalized for two weeks. Um, also due to meds cause uh, bleeding in, in this uh, patient's uh, son or daughter or wound developing due to an IV line. So you do get some fairly serious reports, um, but again about half of them um, tend to be things dissatisfiers such as, the, you know, for example things like the bed is uncomfortable, uh, it took physiotherapy too long to come, this kind of thing that may not, that although it's dissatisfying and, and unfortunate for family members, it might not be directly uh, safety related. Um, so as I talked about in the introduction, we did break uh, adverse events down by type. Uh, and as I said, we, we had the six types, medication problems, equipment problems, complications, miscommunications between staff or between family and, and the patient's, sorry, between the patient's family and staff. So I'm, the next question is uh, to the audience, of what do you think is the most frequent type of event reported by families? And I think Doug can open up the poll. These questions are absolutely terrific. I, I, I can just feel a very engaging conversation coming. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that, that, that does give me a chance to remind everyone to, uh, to, to don't hesitate to ask any questions at this point, like to, to start typing them in now, just so we don't forget them when the time comes. All right, looks like all the answers are in, I think. Answers are in. It looks like 57% of the most common answer is miscommunication between staff and family at 57%. Followed okay. By miscommunication between staff at 27%. Okay. Interesting. Um, most common in ours was uh, miscommunication between staff. Uh, this is the gross number here, not percent. And uh, you can see that between medication problems and miscommunication between staff, uh, were the two highest, and then mis miscommunication between family and staff uh, was a bit lower. Um, and again, you know, this uh, is pretty consistent with the literature. Um, you know, if, if you look at the uh, Baker Norton study or other ones, medication problems are, are a huge uh, source of adverse events in the hospital. And then depending on, you know, whether you look at it from a purely technical or more of a sociological angle, uh, 
um, a lot of the even medication errors can be attributed to miscommunication. So um, I think I think that was a good um, quite way to look at the data in our study and uh, again c consistent with the literature and, and consistent with what people would expect. Um, so the next question is, you know, and this is something that came up a lot in the development of the survey, is, you know, certainly with the parent, parent and uh, family advisory group that we work with, is that, you know, sometimes family members who are in hospital actually do fear that if they annoy healthcare workers that they'll um, suffer some type of reprisal as a result of that. And so we were interested to know whether families would be willing to report adverse events and, and be identified as having done so, or would they fear uh, reporting adverse events and being known as kind of troublemakers and only want to do it on an anonymous basis. So we're curious to know what the audience thinks about whether families would be willing to report um, anonymously or would they be willing to go ahead and reveal that they've reported an adverse event. People are obviously thinking about this one. The answers are coming in a little bit slower, so they're uh, <laughs> taking some time. That's probably because I asked the question in like 50 words. <laughs> <laughs> and 73% have said no. Uh, they won't. They and 27% have said yes. They will only report on an anonymous basis. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, I so you actually, the audience is, is spot on. Um, yeah, most people, four out of five, were uh, willing to voluntarily uh, fill in their information. Um, and, and that's actually an underestimate because the, there are people who probably would be willing to, to be identified, but who were just too rushed or lazy to actually put their name and contact information on the form, right? So it seems that at least 80% of people in our city were willing to be identified, um, which actually was a bit of a surprise to me. I thought it might actually be a little bit less. Um, I thought maybe families would be a little bit more concerned about being uh, pegged as troublemakers, but that's great. Um, and then we, we asked a further question about uh, of the families who actually left their names, would you be willing to be contacted in the future to participate in efforts at the hospital to prevent a recurrence? And, and again, overwhelmingly, most people uh, said that they would. In fact, um, the, the most common reason cited why patients or, or sorry, families said that they wouldn't want to be contacted to participate is because they live too far away. Um, in fact, I think that's, I mean, maybe I got a few people who, who gave a different reason uh, spontaneously, but most people were very willing, um, and a lot of people said they'd love to, but they just live too far away. So the message there is that, you know, these families are, are really a uh, motivated and reliable workforce. So. I think this, this gets us back to the whole philosophy. I mean, this is the paper that we presented and the research that we did, but it's really a kind of a sociological experiment, you know, in, in healthcare that um, is a very progressive idea, right? Um, for example, if you go into a hospital, certainly in my hospital, you know, where I work, um, you know, families there, patients there, almost I mean, they're not involved very much in organizational change, and I get families asking me all the time, can I get access to my hospital records, can, you know, what does this mean, what does that mean, I want to see my CT, and it's very hard for them to get it. I mean, I'm very liberal, and I'll say, sure, yeah, take it. It doesn't matter to me, take a photocopy, but the, it's, it's, it's really not, the system isn't really designed for patients to have a lot of power within the hospital structure. Um, and this, this, the lesson really of this paper is that the, the patients actually do have a lot of valuable information to give um, and they're very willing to give it so that we really felt that this is something that can be used going forward um, as a more as a really proactive way to improve safety and, and other aspects in healthcare as well. Um, the Anne Marie now is going to talk about the uh, the next step of where we're going to go from here. Anne Marie is the really the, the person who actually does the, the practical real work um, at Children's in this area and with the patient safety reporting system. Um, so we're going to turn it over to here now, to her now. I'll jump right in. Um, I think when we finished a research project like this one, we were really excited about what we learned and, and really eager to try and make that part of what people would do on their day-to-day, uh, -day, on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we found is we needed to find a way to bridge that gap between 
the research and all of the great learnings that came out of it and actually putting this into practice. And so we had quite a period of time where we really, things kind of stalled a little bit. And then recently, really spurred on by the publication of the most recent paper, um, we went back to this again and said, what, what do we really need to do if we're going to try and establish and sustain and spread a program like this? Not just at BC Children, but from our perspective, which is more provincial, how can we actually use our provincial ties and connections and enablers to try and make this available more widely to people in the province? So we took a look at this and realized that we really needed to, to start by engaging some champions and finding those really important first followers who would really embrace this and own it and take it on and move it forward um, once we sort of help them get it started. We had to identify the resources that would be required because during the um, research project we had people like Kate who were so engaged and, and so great at going and getting information from those families but in the longer term, we needed to look at how that was going to be done. And just so people know, after the project was finished, the uh, reporting survey was still available on computers that children that parents had access to. But there wasn't any active effort to go and actually try and um, elicit their feedback and discharge, and so things kind of tapered off. Um, we also had to quantify the cost uh, involved, see if we could find some funding for this. And because we were moving from really the project into more of an operational mode, we needed to take a look at the processes. Um, for example, things like um, during the project, we had a connection with Susan Heathcote and the risk management department at Children, where we were able to make sure that there was a bit of an eye on things that parents reported that um, might cause a bit of a concern or need some additional follow-up. So we needed to look at the processes we might use for that in the longer term obviously to build some partnerships with different groups and, and uh, people. And we really needed to be creative around how we thought about that. And I need to give some credit to Denise Hudson, who's here in the room with me today, who's really taken this forward at Children's and has really put on the, the thinking cap to see how we can do this. Um, Jeremy, can you move me forward one slide, please? Great, thank you. And so basically, we've now put in place a project plan. Um, we were able to secure operational leadership for this, and we thought that was the most important piece um, to move this forward at Children's. We have support from Larry Gold, who is the president of Children's, as well as uh, some of the senior operational leaders, and people also um, that were involved during the research project who really thought this was a great project and were quite um, willing and eager to help continue it and to get it going again and help use it as an opportunity to spread it in other parts of the organization as well. So there is a, a work, working group established and the pilot site confirmed, and it is the same site that was involved in the research project. We really will be able to build on their previous experience and um, get their input on how things worked for them. And then from there, we've done those things already. And so where we're at right now is building on the research to evolve the model into an operational way of doing this work. And I think probably one of the really interesting things that we've been able to do is engage volunteer services at BC Children's. And so what we're looking to do is use the opportunity to engage, engage volunteers at Children's, ideally ones that have some experience already, and help them learn to engage families in the same way that Kate did during the study um, to get their input through the reporting tool. And we think this will give a really great opportunity for folks, many of whom are volunteers, young people looking to go into careers in the healthcare field, to give them an opportunity to both engage with families and patients and directly and to learn more about patient safety and its importance to those patients and their families. Um, Partners in Care is a group that was involved in the study as well and represents parents um, of patients that have been through uh, BC Children. And of course, we're engaging representatives of risk management and quality and safety so that they can take learning that comes out of the tool and move it forward, along with operational leaders and clinical staff. And we're using our BCPFLS tool, as we did in the pilot. And we're, our plan for GoLide is in August 2012, after children uh, completes its accreditation uh, next month. So that's really all I've, I've got to say about sort of where we're at, but we're really excited to be moving it forward. I hope that what we learn will be beneficial to others in the province as well as to some of you on the call as well. Great. Excellent presentation. Hi, everyone. It's Tracy again. Thank you very much, uh, um, Mark.
Jeremy and Anne-Marie. It's great to see um, a, an operational initiative come from the fruits of all your labor of the, the research and, and knowing that the operational initiative is, is really um, based in so much research really exciting and moving forward. Um, I, I know that I have a couple questions, but I'm, I'm kind of keen um, to toss it open to our floor because I'd love to hear some participation from um, the collaborative itself. So um, does anybody have any questions? Or Doug, have you seen any questions come along? Yes, we have quite a number of questions. OK, so why don't we <laughs> set over to then for a bit? All right. And uh, some of the questions reference uh, certain parts of the presentation. And there were a number of parts to the presentation, different studies that were mentioned, et cetera. So if you just mentioned uh, a particular study, we, I may not know exactly which study you're referring to. So if we're answering the question incorrectly, please feel free to type in a, a follow-up for clarification so we can help make sure we're answering your question appropriately. Uh, but the first question is from Stephanie, and she's asking, it was mentioned that the study looked at quality of info in the reports. He, she was just wondering if you can elaborate a bit more on that. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. um, Yeah, sure thing. Um, initially when we did the research, what we did was, you know, Really, really what that came down to was looking at the amount of detail in the report in order to determine whether it would be possible to corroborate it or not. So, for example, uh, if a patient in our early system had reported medication error occurred, and that was all the details you had, then we would have rated that as a sort of lower quality of information as opposed to something like on March 21st at 1400 hours uh, nurse X gave Y drug which was contraindicated for you know Z reason. Um, in the end we didn't end up publishing that um, because it was a bit disparate um, but we did collect it in, in the beginning. Yeah, so basically the independent reviewers that we have of these reports were asked to value the information that was actually received in the report. And it's always this trade-off between um, open-ended questions and closed questions. So you know, if you ask a closed question, people can just select, you know, select from a drop-down list. In an open-ended question, one gets much more rich information, but it can be sometimes difficult to interpret. So it's always this trade-off when collecting the information. So, so as, as the practical learning point, what we ended up doing in our system was, was requiring both an answer to a closed question, so which, uh, say, medication event occurred, and then requiring them to provide some type of uh, clarifying detail, uh, which would help us in the future. That was the kind of practical uh, take home. And we did uh, make a system change to, to enforce that through, uh, during the development of the system. So the next question we have is from Jan, and she's asking what was the uh, feedback that was given to the families? Um, well, uh, when, for example, when I would be uh, collecting information from families, um, I would say, okay, thanks very much for reporting that. Um, it's going to go to the quality and safety uh, department. Um, the, at that point, it went to Sue Heathcote and, and Anne Marie um, and entered their uh, quality assurance program. I don't know if we have Sue. Is Sue with us? No, I don't think so. Maybe Anne Marie, do you, do you want to talk about how you guys would handle the reports when they would come to your department? Um, yeah, it was basically Sue that was doing that work, and so the process was that um, anything that had, she, she certainly looked at the data in the aggregate, but any specific individual reports that were of any concern, where there was any indication there might have been real harm, or somebody was clearly quite concerned about what had happened to the child, um, she took a look at those and would try and determine exactly you know, when, when it happened and whom it happened to and would follow up by doing chart review and so forth, and potentially um, have, be able to contact the family if necessary. Um, I think in general, feedback to the family, um, one of the questions we've had as we're starting to go forward with this has been, you know, what will be the burden placed on um, the system in general? Will the families actually expect a lot of feedback if they are reporting? And I think during the study, um, I, maybe Mar um, 
Jeremy, you can comment on that, but I don't think that was a particularly um, problematic area if I, that I recall. No, can I make a comment on that? You know, during the days that Jeremy and I dreamed up this idea, the, the idea really was that we would actually train families or family participants in the project to actually be able to screen these reports. And, you know, if you're having a look at many of these reports already coming about communication issues, we really felt that a lot of these could actually be dealt with, with um, you know, um, patient representatives rather than this actually being handled by quality and safety. This hasn't happened, but obviously in an ideal system, I think there's huge potential to really get families involved in actually making the, the whole system better with these reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and, and that was one of the lessons from the, the literature review, uh, some of the work that Saul Weingart had done in, at uh, Dana-Farber in Boston show, showed that, you know, for example, when you have uh, patient committee volunteers going around to patients in the hospital asking them about whether or not adverse events have occurred or not, uh, you actually get a lot more information than if it's done uh, by a researcher or particularly a hospital administrator. Uh, patients are much more open with peers uh, as uh, patient advisory groups than they are with uh, administrators or researchers. So um, hence the dream to really have uh, a patient-centered adverse event reporting system that works with the hospital administration. Uh, next question. Yeah, um, I, I have I have a couple of comments. Uh, it's Elaine, and, and I just want to add to what Tracy said. What a fantastic presentation! My thanks to uh, to the three of you and, and your team. Just in terms of the uh, nineteen percent um, adverse events that um, that you were, that you spoke about. Just a bit of information, and and I don't believe this is published as yet, but very soon to be, and Matt Lau and um, Ross Baker and, and, and many others who I'm sure are well known to all of us on the um, uh, webinar this morning, recently completed the Canadian Pediatric Adverse Event Study, um, very similar to the, the 2004 uh, Baker Norton, but of course this was one, I think the first, um, specific to pediatrics. And mm -hmm. um, it was interesting, and in, in, we all worked together on this, and in the original validation study, we were seeing about 15% adverse events. However, in the Canadian Pediatric Adverse Event Study, which was designed methodologically specifically to look at AEs and not validate tools or anything like that, the um, the the rate of AEs actually dropped down to about seven seven and a half percent, and and I don't want to be quoted exactly, but I know that's the ballpark that um, that uh, that reporting is sitting in. So it's very very interesting um, when we're looking at family reporting uh, to to sort of see the the nineteen percent. Yeah, I mean it's. It's, it's really interesting when you look at the different ways to go about learning about quality defects, you know, I mean, you can go with chart reviews and that's one technique, but of course if it's not charted in, in the charts, then, you know, you don't find out about it and if uh, the physicians don't, or nurses or uh, ancillary healthcare workers don't report it, you don't learn about it from the clinician reporting system and if, so, you know, what these really are are all kind of several imperfect systems working together. Um, and, and that's another question is, you know, how does one combine um, frequency estimates of adverse events from multiple imperfect systems working together, right? Um, yeah. And there, there is actually a paper about, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry, Jeremy, I was just going to comment, you know, my comment to Elaine is that, you know, there's many different ways that we can look for adverse events, and I think in this study, we did try to compare each adverse event that was reported by families with those that were reported by, reported by healthcare providers, and we found almost zero overlap. So, you know, this just really goes to show that we're going to need more than one tool to really be able to identify these learning opportunities. That's fascinating. I mean, in, that's, it's 
Tracy, this is, that was one of the questions that I had was what was the, the correlation with what was reported by staff and um, really interesting to know that there was almost no overlap. And so how does that information move then, maybe it's a question more for Anne Maria, how does that combined information move through an organization then to paint a bigger picture of what's mm -hmm. truly going on? Does yeah. it, where would it get talked at? You know, how do we validate or, or uh, take as valid the responses from families when we're healthcare providers as, um, as importantly as the ones that are reported by staff? And so how do you combine that and take that information forward in an organization? It's, it's great stuff. Yeah, I think Tracy, it's Dan Ray, I think Tracy, um, one of the, it's one of the things that we've really been looking at with our project to move this forward um, at BC Children's. And so what we've looked at is having the information go forward to what's called the Child Health Quality of Care Committee here. And it's got senior operational leaders as well as clinicians and so forth on it. And so what we're thinking is that making that information um, in the aggregate forward to inform the work and the thinking of that group a group that already receives presentations on data that comes out of the um, staff reporting, adverse event reporting system, is a good way to marry those two pieces of information together so that both can be used to inform the work that that group will be leading. Hmm. Great stuff. Just, um, if I can, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Anne Marie, you know, just a real quick, Anne Marie, Jeremy, and, and uh, Mark, you, I, I'm hoping, so hoping that you're going to submit this work as a poster abstract for this year's conference. Um, I mean, we, we could, yeah, sure. Yeah, we could. Sure, why not? There you go. It's, it's, all, it, it, it's just so important to share this. It's an outstanding, outstanding uh, piece of work. Well, and it'll definitely garner a lot of interest since the CAFI conference is out west and in Vancouver. and. People that will have heard it online here today will be able to follow up with some more uh, questions if we don't get through them all today. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Doug, yeah, we, we, just, we do. I, I just. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jeremy. No, I was um, Darlene Bolivar on the uh, chat portion of the uh, uh, system. I just wanted to make the point about um, adolescent uh, healthcare and and how our system really dealt with pediatrics and a lot of the previously published work had been had been done on adults and and about the challenges and opportunities for developing an adolescent based system um, so she just wanted to bring that up to the audience as an additional further opportunity uh, to expand on kind of the middle ground kind of uh, neat group that we do have in healthcare sorry and go, go on with the question no, no, that's okay. I just uh, just wanted to point out that those that chat session isn't visible to the audience. So I appreciate you you bringing that up on uh, Darlene's behalf. And Darlene, I was going to mention if you want to jump in with your own questions, don't uh, don't hesitate. Uh, so the next question that we had submitted is from Wendy, and she was asking: Were the adverse events documented by fa documented by families, uh, documented by staff as well, and therefore duplicates in the SRS? I think we've already answered that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, see, see the report. Um, the the CMAJ paper actually goes through the um, the actual correlation, and and, a, and as an online appendix, you can actually see the the description of the uh, adverse event that was matched. So, yeah. All right. Uh, moving on, we've got another question from Don, who's asked, "Have you util have you utilized a paper form of this study?" Practically, without a study nurse providing the laptop for families to use, it may be difficult to get this completed. And she also goes on to say that many pediatric patients are isolated, so there are infection control issues with laptops, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good thought. We, the way we actually envisioned this uh, study to be done was um, with a kiosk that the family members would be invited to interact with upon their discharge. Um, I guess if, if that were done, it would resolve the infection control issue. Um, actually, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of actually the infection control protocol when, say, an MRSA patient is discharged from hospital. <laughs> but uh, I, it's like maybe someone else can talk about that. But um, we, we saw it as a uh, as a kiosk in the future. But yeah, really good point. But your 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 other question about do we use a paper system? Um, no, we we went directly with the electronic system. 
Um, all, some of the previous work had been done with uh, paper. Uh, certainly saw Weingart stuff in Boston had been done with paper surveys, but um, we really felt that since we wanted to collect the data and we're, Mark's an informatician and I used to be an engineer, so <laughs> we, we like computers. You know, I also think that the opportunity for sending this electronically to patients at home, I think is really how we need to look at doing this in the future. Yeah, and, uh, and, and Laurel's actually put in a question that's sort of related. She's asked about how about an app, so for an iPad or an iPhone or something along that line as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all wonderful ideas, all wonderful ideas. You do, you do deal with issues about um, hospital information protection and privacy and firewalls and, and how to access it technically, but um, certainly, you know, a system where a family member could get an email on their drive home on their BlackBerry and um, have someone in the car and not the person driving responding to the questions is totally an opportunity, right? Yeah, I, I know that you can speak to Anne-Marie about this if you want more details. I mean, even to get reports from outside of our facility to other facilities has been a, a, major, a major challenge. Yeah. yeah, and all of this has, has certainly come up in our um, work on the project, and all great ideas, and I think a couple of them that we're going to try and pursue, so we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. Hi, it's Darlene, um, and I think it's great work that you've done. I'm just wondering if we can even move it more into a prospective manner. I've, I'm including myself with you, as you can hear, um, so that it's not just done on discharge so that you have an accurate reporting, but it could be during ongoing care so that there's a better opportunity to intervene and correct or, um, you know, deal with the family at a, a, a point in time that it's happening versus a retrospective look on discharge. Diana, I think that's a fantastic, fantastic comment. And, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges for us in this reporting systems, all of these reporting systems, from a purely clinician perspective, is that it's so hard for, for us to really give feedback to the people who've reported. And the process is so long and drawn out that very often the people at the front line don't really feel it's worth reporting because there's no action taken on that report. But you can also imagine that dealing with something when it's still hot and, you know, in real time almost, as you say, really as soon after the event has happened, is really going to provide the most benefit. But how one actually does that practically is, is a huge challenge. Um, so certainly in the ideal world, it would be the fact that if a patient reported something today, we could have a team of people that would go and resolve that issue tomorrow. But the resources to do that is, are going to be enormous. I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it, but I think that it has huge resource implications, which is really getting back to that, you know, the original idea that we had was to really get family representatives involved as the sort of first line to be able to deal with some of these issues. And, and, and on that note, Darlene, you know, the, and this is something that I remember we talked about back in Vancouver. Um, well, I was in the ICU the other day in my hospital in, in Hamilton, and uh, I just saw the most, I thought it was the most wonderful thing to actually see this in practice because this was an initiative that was actually done just on the spot by this wonderful intensivist that we have. Uh, during the ICU rounds, and I don't know if you ever participated in them, but um, classically, when I did them uh, at my old hospital, we would close the curtain on the family so that they couldn't hear. This intensivist here in Hamilton actually said, oh, let's invite that family to participate in the rounds, you know, which was just the most wonderful thing to see, this uh, great guy who thought that that was an important part of the family-centered care actually electing to go ahead and do that. And, and maybe that's another opportunity for families to feed back information about quality defects into the system, you know? Absolutely. Um, uh, just uh, looking through the list of questions, I think we're having such a broad discussion, I think we're, we're answering some later on. I'm going to continue to read them, so uh, you know, feel free to, to, to remind me if some of these have already been answered. But uh, The next question uh, has not been answered, at least not that I heard, uh, was uh, were interpreters available for non-English speaking families who completed the survey? Yeah, unfortunately, no. In in this study, we we wanted to keep things very simple. Um, 
you know, when, when you do research or any kind of practical project, you, can, you can't go biting off more than you can chew. And we were already taking several steps in this project. You know, we were doing this for the, for the first time in pediatrics and really for the first time with a computer system. So that was already two big leaps forward. And then we, so we just said to keep things simple and manageable, we just restricted it to English-speaking population, um, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, I think there is a real opportunity to be able to translate this fairly easily. I mean, you know, and that's obviously another major advantage of using an electronic format. And you know, during the initial design phase, we did consider that option of, you know, having a, a translation. But um, you know, with the limited resources we had to do it, we couldn't do it at that stage. But it certainly, is an option going forward. Yeah, and and that's again like a really important population. Um, to be asking about the frequency of adverse events, right? People with communication uh, problems of any sort, right? Um, at much higher risk of adverse events. We know that from the literature, so good point. Doug, do we have um, time for many more questions? Because I know that uh, our time is almost up. Uh, and it's a great discussion. I almost actually lost track of time until I just looked up and realized we're kind of at the end. So do you have any highlight questions you want to make sure we zoom in on? Um, could I could I make a few comments? Is there? Sure, I'm sure. Go ahead. Be great. And just for the benefit of those that have questions that haven't been asked, um, I know that our speakers would be more than happy to answer them uh, by other means, uh, i.e., electronic or um, through uh, the CAFC office if need be. So don't. Mm -hmm. just, we will get those. And if they do do that abstract, then we can you can come to CAFC in in October and make sure they get it. <laughs> Most definitely, just email liberally. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I would just really like to thank everybody, CAFC today and, and everybody who's been involved in organizing this, and thank you to all of you who've attended, thank you so much. But I really would like to just say that you know, this is a, a huge undertaking to bring to an organization, and please don't underestimate it. This is a huge change in practice. You're going to come across many people who are very concerned about this and the risks and li potential liabilities that are involved. But at the end of the day, please be reassured this is really important for our patients. And thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, just uh, glancing through some of the questions, there, there's a number that are along the theme of, uh, there was another question about follow-up into incidences for which there was no coexisting staff report, so that difference between what families are reporting and staff are reporting. But a lot of the questions are, uh, which I think we've already answered that one, uh, but th there's a lot of questions that are about the follow-up. So how was this information, someone has asked, how was this information uh, used by the organization to improve care? Uh, what changes have been made to ensure safe care, you know, safe measures, et cetera, based on, on the results so far? Uh, you know, is there any highlights mm -hmm. there that you can throw out? I think Anne Marie is probably the best person to answer that, yeah. I think what we found during the study was that, you know, as, as Jeremy just said, it was such a huge change for people, and there was a lot of concern at the onset about the kinds of things family was, families would report, um, a lot of sensitivity about that. And over the course of the study, I think people came to realize that um, this was okay, that they could learn from the families, that it was, um, the families were reporting things that were legitimate, and uh, that they didn't need to be too concerned about, about kinds of things they were concerned about at the beginning. But during the course of the study, the focus really was on um, getting this in place and engaging the families and looking at the data and so forth. So the ultimate goal is to take the information that families are providing and use it to affect positive change. And that's the, the focus that we have now with moving it forward. Um, and I think there's more of a, a comfort now, particularly with the unit that was involved in the project, um, with doing that. So during the, the study, they certainly looked at what families were saying, and I think they found it interesting and to some degree reassuring, um, but there wasn't a whole lot of specific examples I could give you about things that changed as a result, um, but we're certainly hoping that that's going to, we're going to move this into the next phase as we go forward with the project. Yeah, I mean, there certainly, there certainly were, you know, all these reports were brought to the safety rounds that were held, you know, on the ward that we were actually investigating. And these, you know, were regular safety rounds where each of the reports were actually presented, and um, I was present at a lot of those. And um, anyway, there was a lot of discussion, and I have no doubt that these reports certainly influenced some of the safety initiatives that were in the ward. But certainly, it was really great for the healthcare providers to have some feedback. Um, 
And, you know, initially they were concerned that this was going to be, you know, complaints and that they were going to have re reported to the principal. But at the end of the day, I think the type of reports that people, you know, that actually came up, I think the staff really began, began to appreciate that. Well, I uh, there is a, a question about uh, the resources required to sustain the program. Do you have any comment on that? Mm -hmm. um, in summary, I, I think as I mentioned or alluded to, and Jeremy's, Jeremy and Mark have mentioned quite a bit too, the intent was really to look at ways that we could engage um, volunteers or, or previous family members um, in some of this. And we really are taking that idea to heart as we're moving this forward. So we are engaging our volunteer services department. We're involving our families, our partners in care families in this as well. Um, it is going to require a little bit of support for training those people and some ongoing um, expertise being applied from quality and safety uh, leads or operational leads as well. But we think it's actually a fairly uh, burden from a resource. But I wouldn't, the one thing I would say is that, you know, the, I think this project only succeeded because we had such, you know, wonderful, dedicated people to it, you know. Um, a lot of people I told this idea about, you know, in hallways and things in medical school said, oh, well, you know, you can't do that. People will sue or negative opinions. But, you know, I think as a real testament to Mark and Anne Marie, who, who really were the ones, and, and also Doug and, and Sue, um, Doug uh, Cochran and Sue Heathcote, who helped on the project, you know, you know, just as an example, when, when we started this idea, I had this idea, I was a mechanical engineer who had no real training in either medicine, no, no training in medicine whatsoever, and almost nothing in quality and safety, but they both actually accepted the idea on its merits and said, okay, let's give it a try. And, and I think that that human resource that we had there was really uh, the reason why the project was successful as it was. Uh, there's just a couple more questions. I think we can get through reasonably quick, quickly. Someone is suggesting that this would be, make for an interesting multi-center study, and they're wondering if you're able to share your tool. That's fine with me. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's published. It's in the publication. And even the electronic version, you'd have to speak to Anne-Marie. And I'm not sure what's happening with the, the reporting system and how it's being shared nationally. I'd be happy and to share the, the electronic version with anybody who's interested. Just I, I must I must say that that's certainly something that I've been thinking about throughout this entire presentation. Yeah. Um, yeah, because cer certainly, as you'll as you, sorry to interrupt, Doug. Certainly, as uh, if you do read the um, development paper that we did, you know you you'll see that it's not just a, f a bunch of questions that we uh, scribbled down in a computer system. We did a fair amount of psychometric work validating the questions. So, if people could benefit from that work without having to redo it, I think that's that's key. Uh, our friend Gerarda has uh, informed us that the pediatric adverse event study is uh, actually still in the review process. It hasn't been published yet, so uh, we can look for that uh, shortly. Thank you, Gerarda. Um, and someone's asking is if BC is the only site implementing this type of a reporting system at this time, or are you aware of any others? Oh, child or You know, to, to be honest, as an electronic system, I, I, it's the only place in the world I think that I'm aware of that's that's tried this in, in hospital reporting system. Yeah, that's that's my understanding as well. We do uh, Alberta and Newfoundland actually are have mental systems as well, and they actually use the same software we do. So it would actually be fairly straightforward for them to adopt something similar if they were interested in doing that. Sounds like somebody has a truck backing up near their office. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the last question we have is, uh, uh, Laurel's asking, are the results kept for information only to improve care, or could these be accessed for litigation purposes? Emory? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good question, actually. I mean, we, it depends on your legislation in your province. We have legislation here that says that information that's um, specifically correct, collected for the purpose of quality review um, is protected from disclosure in those kinds of uh, litigation efforts. Nobody's ever asked for this specific data, so we'd have to see how it would stand a challenge. But I, I think it's an interesting question, actually. Um, yeah, I, I think we probably it would probably be considered protected, but I wouldn't necessarily stand on that. Yeah, I don't think there's much case law on the matter, so. <laughs> <laughs> on, 
on that right. note, and that, knowing that we that's are all we have. on behalf of the CAFT Patient Safety Collaborative, I do want to most sincerely thank Jeremy, Mark, and Anne-Marie. Um, one of uh, Darlene's comments as she just had to sign off was saying that this has been one of the most uh, lively and, and uh, interactive chats that we've had in a while, and I really must reiterate that. It's been great. Lots of people had lots of questions, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing more as, the, as you uh, move this into an operational mode. And thanks for sharing uh, all of your, your literature and, uh, and the great success that you've had to date. So thank you very much. Um, also, uh, just to remind all the collaborative participants that our next presentation will be held on June 22nd, which is the Friday, uh, third Friday actually in this particular month. Um, normally we're on the fourth Friday, but because of the long weekend, we'll be on June 22nd and for more details on that. Thanks again, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend, and thanks again to our presenters. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.